On the 28th of March, 2017, myself and 14 others cut through a fence on the northern side of Stansted Airport. On the night of March 28th, 2017, along with 14 other people, um, I cut a hole in the fence at Stansted Airport um, and gained access to a very remote part of the northern side of the airport. We had been watching this area for some time, uh, watching the schedule and the routine of charter flight deportations. The flight was due to deport around 50 people to Nigeria and Ghana, um, and we were there to stop it. We had two tripods with us and several lock-on tubes. Uh, we all went through this hole in the fence, walked across a piece of grass, and towards the parked Boeing 767, which was a Titan Airways uh, chartered jet. Um, as we got there, four people went off and surrounded the front wheel of the plane and locked on. Uh, the rest of us went to an area behind the wing and we set up one of the tripods, which, which had a banner saying no one is illegal. And I climbed on top of it. Um, I made my way across a, a grassy knoll um, to a plane that was parked there tied myself around the front wheel with three other people. And we stayed there for 10 hours. I was the last one arrested at nearly 8 a.m. They had to get the staircase that usually goes to the plane for people to board. Um, and they used that with officers and climbing equipment. And they <laughs> pretty much pulled me off the tripod and uh, arrested me. Prior to the action, I had known about these charter flight deportations and the deportation process as a whole. Um, and I knew them to be unlawful. We knew of at least three people that were on that flight that faced um, persecution, death, torture, violence, um, were they to be deported. There are people who are being detained and deported when they have on, ongoing asylum appeals, they have ongoing cases, and they're waiting for those cases to be heard. We knew the practice of charter flights to be a brutal one and to be one in which violence is, is kind of endemic. They use waist restraint belts, shackles, they restrain people's arms and legs. They in, in watching these planes, um, in watching the process, we knew that ambulances were called to the terminal just in case. There was uh, the case of Jeremy Mubenga, who was killed by two security guards when he was being deported back in 2010. But then the violence of the actual deportation, you know, the, the things that people were facing when they reached the place that they were being taken to. And so, although we knew of three, we knew that there would be many, many more that were facing um, potentially deaf, and so we had to act. As a result of our action, we know that the plane was chartered two days later with around half the people on the flight, simply because they couldn't get a big enough plane. Um, and then from the action until the start of our trial, we knew that um, around 60 people had been deported and that 11 still remain in the country. Two of those people we now know have leave to remain. Four of those people have been referred to the National Referral Mechanism for pe Victims of um, human trafficking, so that can be either domestic slavery or sex slavery. On any given um, day when a deportation is happening, there could be numerous raids in homes, communities, people picked up at reporting centers, and people coming from detention centers on multiple coaches to the airport. But there's only one plane. So that was strategic in 
understanding that in order to give people time to call their solicitor, give people time for their cases to be heard, we had to stop that plane. Um, people are, when this action was being taken, we knew that people were given five days notice before um, they're deported. In those five days, they usually occur over a weekend. So you've got two days left. So you've got three days left for them to contact a solicitor. They might not even have a solicitor, so they have to apply for legal aid. Legal aid probably takes one or two days. There's usually a waiting list. So it's unlikely that you would get legal advice in that moment. So you've got a day, 24 hours to try and stop your deportation. It's not much time at all. Queer people, when they're still in this country, are forced to humiliate themselves to prove their sexuality um, because the Home Office kind of sits there and, and takes their, their blanket kind of baseline. Opinion is that these people are lying. And then beyond that, if they're not able to prove by various different archaic means their queerness, um, they are then taken to places often where they haven't been for a very, very, very long time, if at all, um, where they face persecution because of their sexuality, where they face corrective rape, um, where they face imprisonment, where they face torture and when they face death. And so I think that it's particularly brutal for um, queer people um, and the, the notion of, of taking someone from a place of relative safety, and I say that, acknowledging the fact that we are far, far, far from perfect anywhere in the world for queer people, to places where it's physically a crime to simply be, um, that in of itself is, is inherently um, vicious. We were originally charged with aggravated trespass, criminal damage and a Stansted bylaw against organising a protest um, or a parade or a demonstration that inhibits the functioning of the airport. Upon arrest, we were not told anything about the charge that we have now. We were not told that we had put people in danger in the airport. We were not told that anyone's safety was at risk. In July of 2017, we were then told that the Attorney General had consented and that we were now being charged under the much harsher um, Section 1 of the Aviation and Maritime Security Act, which comes with a maximum life imprisonment as opposed to aggravated trespass. Aggravated trespass is a charge which carries a maximum of three months in prison. This legislation, which is part of the Aviation and Maritime Security Act, came out of the Locker 1988 Lockerbie bombing. So this is really the first time this charge has been used on nonviolent protesters. The first time it was used was for a completely different scenario. It was a man driving a helicopter erratically and intentionally into an airport control tower. So you can see that it's, I mean, pretty different from the action we took, which was essentially lying on the ground for 10 hours and not moving. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a, there's a huge question as to why they're using this charge and, and I, I, we can't help but think it's because they don't want these actions to go forward. We can't help but think it's because we've used our action and we've used the platform um, and the attention that we got to expose these flights and to expose them for what they are. Um, and they don't like that that's happening. It's, they happen in the middle of, these flights happen in the middle of the night for the very purpose that they want to keep them hidden. They want to keep them secret because they know that they're barely legal. They know how violent they are and they know that they're part of a racist border practice which targets communities. We received such an unprecedented charge because we, 
because our action struck at the heart of Theresa May's legacy. Um, her legacy as, as Home Secretary is essentially what led to Amber Rudd having to resign. It's, it is the hostile environment. It is the creation of a racist, brutal set of laws and policies um, and a, a toxic culture within the Home Office that has kind of been laid out across the newspapers over the last 12 months or so. So it came as a surprise that we were charged with this, but then at the same time, we did something that no one else has done, and that is poke the bear in its cave. I mean, this is this is the Home Office. The prosecution, and more widely, the Crown Prosecution Service, the Home Office, um, and the establishment are trying to throw the book at us, uh, trying to make an example of us. Um, every single day in court, despite the Home Office not being on trial, there have been Home Office barristers there taking notes. There have been police there every single day, much more than they normally would. And I think this really gets to the, the core of the issue and gets to the, the core of what's going on here. This isn't just about whether or not 15 people lying in a cold, remote part of an airport somehow magically endangered the entire airport. It's about the Home Office and striking to the heart of the legacy, the evil legacy that was left behind by our now Prime Minister, Theresa May. It's overblown and it's outrageous. And um, the history of nonviolent political protests in this, in this country will change if they can use this charge and set a precedent and set case law for using it. The Home Office is not operating democratically. The Home Office is, frankly, one of the worst institutions in this country that we have. And so much of it needs to change. And I think it was really hard to be interrogated on that, but not be able to say, well, why don't you interrog interrogate the very people who are like, putting people on these planes and deporting them to their death, pretty much. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't think I answered that very well. I wanted to say, like, we shouldn't be on trial. <laughs> we shouldn't be on trial. The Home Office should be on trial because we're, we're trying to do the exact opposite of what they're doing, which is deporting people to their deaths. It's hard when you're constantly battling, you know, every day is a fight in the courtroom. The thing that I've been thinking about a lot in these final few weeks of the trial is how analogous our situation is with people that have to engage with the immigration system and how lucky I am, not only that at the end of this, regardless of whether or not we get a custodial sentence, regardless or not of whether we get found guilty, I still have the right to remain. I still have, I still have the right to be in the country where I have my family and my networks and my life, regardless of whether my liberty is taken away for a little bit or not, I still come out to that. The people engaging with the immigration system, people being forced into detention, being threatened with and then deported do not have that. They don't have that luxury, that right. And often, more often than not, they don't have the luxury of a network of people around them um, who are there to pick up the pieces. And you know, we've had some incredible support of people that have been helping us. There's no other place where the idea of solidarity and the idea of care and activist care really come in then at that point because um because i don't i don't know how we could have gone gotten through this without without having those politics in place i've barely held it together and i have had a world of people standing directly behind me making sure i'm still upright and they're in court every single day what about the people that don't have that what about the people that are facing down this government alone This is one flight 
that we stopped of thousands of flights that have gone. Um, it's really, really critical that we continue to fight. We continue to make sure the voices of those inside detention and those targeted by these deportations are heard. I think the Windrush scandal and the changing of landscape and the changing of the landscape that, that came from that has given a lot of people hope. Um, when we took the action, we were doing it off the back of decades of hard, hard work and labour and activism from people within detention centres, people who had been organising things like the hunger strikes and various different kind of riots and people that have been organising outside of detention centres and outside of the immigration system, um, you know, alongside those facing persecution. And we were, you know, we were only able to do our action because of them. But now, with the way in which it's kind of suddenly been become very mainstream, it's a lot, it becomes slightly easier, I think, in a way, to have those conversations and, and to be able to kind of push people um, in positions of power to make bolder statements, to make um, bolder claims, to to make good on, on the politics that they've kind of been acting on. Um, and I think that, yeah, it's, if anything that's kind of come out of these last 18 months, it feels like a brighter place to be fighting this fight than it was when we did it. In a way, I think it was successful. We stopped that plane and that's what we wanted to do. It, it is an action that takes a lot of energy, um, especially and, and time and privilege. If you're going to take an action like that, you don't really expect that you're going to be in the same, you're going to be dealing with it 18, month la 18 months later and going through a nearly 10 week long Crown Court trial. So it's, it's a huge process and it's a huge kind of weight to carry, but 11 people are still in the country and that is incredible. And every day that we're sat in court listening to the prosecution interrogate us and berate us around the reasons why we took this action, it, it just reminds me of how right we were and how important it was. Someone who was meant to be on that flight, his girlfriend was pregnant. He was going to be deported and he was never going to see his child again. And he managed to get bail and he managed to get his leave to remain. And so now he's with his partner and he's with his children. And that just makes all the difference.